My name is Brian Baker, and I'm the director of Orphans and Widows for our denomination. I work for GC Missions, General Conference Missions, and get the opportunity to travel around the world, and especially my favorite thing about the ministry is I get to be in a, a different church almost every Sabbath and see old friends and make new friends and uh, see familiar faces, and it's a joy to be here today and to have a lot of my family here today. Uh, Greg and Jeff Baker are my cousins, and uh, Greg is a dear friend. I consider him one of my closest friends, and uh, it's a, it was a joy to spend the past couple days with you, Greg, and to be here with my family. If you remember, I'm going to share a little bit of the word today before I get into a report, and uh, Jesus had the Sermon on the Mount, and he talked about storing up treasures in heaven. If you remember the verses, it says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy. He's talking about having nice homes, and, and this past week we shared our homes with others as we had Thanksgiving dinner. We wanted our homes to look nice for all of our visitors to come in. We put a lot of time into making sure our house was kept up and looking good for people to arrive through our front doors, and, and we especially didn't want our mother to see our homes in disarray. If you're like my wife, you uh, do not want your mother to see that. It goes on to say, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or drink. And we wanted to make sure that we had the, the, the biggest feast possible on our tables this two days ago. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into that feast. We probably spent about two days on that meal. There was a day of buying all the food and, and then starting to prepare the food even the day before. You might have even got the turkey in on Wednesday and started cooking it through the night to have the big feast the next day. And then it goes on to say, why do you worry about your clothes? And it says, look at the sparrows. Even God takes care of them. And look at their nice clothes that they wear. It's talking about our food, our clothing, and our shelter. The three basic necessities in life. And it's saying, God says, don't worry about these things. But he says in verse 33 of chapter 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If you put your priorities in line and aren't so worried about your homes, your homes, your food and your clothing, that he will take care of those things. But we put a lot of time into worrying about those things, especially this time of year. Imagine if Pastor Tim had stood up here in the pulpit and said, we're not going to, uh, as a church, I would like to incorporate, I'd like to start this week off right, and for the next seven days, we're go I'm calling a fast for our church. We would be like, uh, bad timing. What is a fast? A fast is one letter short of a feast, but it's the exact opposite. In Isaiah 58, it says, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? When we, when we are fasting, we are drawing closer to the Lord. We're seeing his heart and his will for our lives. That's what a fast is about. It's the exact opposite of relying on ourselves for a big feast upon our table. It is putting our focus on the Lord and not being so concerned about our own appetites and our own needs, but being more concerned about others. So the Lord is saying here in Isaiah 58, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Here it is, again, these three things, food, clothing, and shelter. The Lord is saying, here's the kind of fast I want you to be involved in. I want you to take care of those people that can't take care of themselves, the orphans and widows among us. It says that you cannot turn away from your own flesh and blood. I'm here to tell you today that our flesh and blood is not just in this room today with us. It is around the world. We call them brothers and sisters in Christ in our Church of God Seventh Day around the world. I'm lucky to be able to share in their lives as I go travel around the world. If you go down to verse 
10 in this same chapter, it says, if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, it goes on to say what a blessing you're going to have in your life. If you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry. And I, I got to looking at that. Spend yourself. I don't even know what that means. I looked at commentaries of what other Bible scholars were saying about spend yourself. What does that mean? And a lot of Bible scholars were saying, this phrase doesn't make any sense to spend yourself. But one commentator said, it would be like spending what you would spend on yourself and giving it away to somebody else. Not being so concerned about my own needs, but taking care of other people's needs first. And I kind of, as I thought about that verse, I was thinking about this widow, and she's listed in 1 Kings chapter 17. It talks about a widow that had a boy, and Elijah came to her and said to her, I need something to eat. She was out gathering sticks. If you remember the story about a widow that was out gathering some sticks, she was getting some fuel to be able to start a fire to cook one last meal for herself. She had just enough flour and oil that she was going to be able to cook one last meal, and then it says, well, I'll read it to you. It says, I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and for my son. This would have been her orphan son because her husband had died. He was a partial orphan. I'm going to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it, and then we're going to die. This was the idea, and Elijah came in and says, well, why don't you just give me that food instead? Imagine the gall of this prophet saying, give me your last meal, and then maybe you can die a little bit sooner. He didn't say that, but you know the story as it unfolded, and all of a sudden this woman's flour and oil miraculously was multiplied day after day until the famine ended, and she was taken care of. Her needs were met. I think about one other passage in Scripture where there was a young boy, and he came to Jesus, and he, didn't, he had enough for himself. He had five loaves and two fishes. And the Lord said, can I have your meal? And he gave it. I don't, see the, I don't read that the boy was like, no, that's mine. That's my meal. Sorry. He gave it away, and it, you know the miraculous story. It fed 5,000. It's giving what we would give to ourselves and maybe being more concerned about others than our own needs, our food, our clothing, and shelter, and be more concerned about people that don't have those things, especially orphans and widows that can't take care of themselves. I started in this ministry 13 years ago because I had a heart for, uh, for people in a worse position than myself. I found myself in a, in a divorce 13 years ago, and I knew that my heart was breaking, and I wanted to get involved in something bigger than my own problems. And I turned to orphan care because it was way bigger than my own problems. Because I knew if I didn't take care of, if I started being self-absorbed by my own misery that I was going through, I was going to end up in some very destructive behaviors, whether I was going to turn to to alcohol or to drugs or to wild women or whatever the case may be. I recognized in myself that my pain was so bad that if I didn't focus it on something bigger than my own problems, I was going to self-destruct. Some of you have been through pain like that yourselves. And when that pain comes, it's a, I think it's a real good idea to get away from your own pain and start thinking about others instead of thinking about yourselves. And so I started working in this ministry. I started working with children that had lost parents to AIDS. I started finding sponsors to them. In fact, this is the, one, this is the third church that I ever went to. It was 11 or 12 years ago that I came to your church and did a presentation and, and raised some funds. And still to this day, many people in this room are still supporting the Orphans and Widows Ministry. And I thank you for that. We've assisted about 400 children with AIDS over the last 13 years. Many of them are, are going on into college and we're paying for their college. I'm very proud. One girl that we are that is in college right now, I just got a report. I was in Kenya a week ago and I just got a report that she's uh, almost finishing up her degree to be a pilot, a commercial pilot. She was an orphan <laughs> and living in a community that had she, I don't know if her parents died of AIDS, but most of our children in Kenya have lost parents to AIDS. 
We started working with children that had lost parents to tribal warfare and, uh, or, or wars in general. And I worked in two communities in Kenya. One was on the north border where uh, Sudanese and Ethiopian people would come down into Kenya and kill the fathers and steal their goat, cows and goats and take them for themselves back across the border into another country, left orphans and widows behind. I worked in another community down in southern Kenya where if you were a young boy and you were about 11 or 12 years old or 13 years old and you wanted to become a man in the Maasai tribe, the Maasai tribe are these these people that dress in all red and they're tall people and they have spears and you've seen them, they jump. I don't know if you've seen these guys, but they jump up and down with their spears. They're known as Maasai warriors. And if you want to be a man in that culture, in that community of people, you have, a, you have to do something to become a man. And that something means you need to kill something. You can either kill a lion and become a man or you can kill another man. And so most boys, I'm going to kill another man. I'm not going to kill a lion, of course. You can't sneak up on a lion when he's sleeping, but you can sleep, sneak up on a man when he's sleeping. And so these boys come, come over into another tribe, into the Gucha tribe, and in the Gucha tribe where we work, we have about 26 children that have lost their fathers because their fathers have been killed by Maasai warriors that live just 15 miles away. After we started working with children that lost parents to AIDS, children that had lost parents to war or tribal conflicts, I became especially interested in, in girls that had been involved in human trafficking or sex trafficking. And we started, to this day, we've assisted 132 girls escape from that tragedy. They were once working in brothels, they were once prostitutes, and now they're in our churches and we're putting them through school. Some of those girls have become nurses now. And some of them have become, uh, there, there's one girl studying to be a lawyer, there's other girls studying to become a banker. Many of them are choosing their occupations now in life as they're graduating from college. And I'm proud of that. When I went to meet them, I, uh, I saw girls there that I met. I know Maybe you can't see that real well, but these girls were, were a little bit older, and I really couldn't assist them because they were, they were um, about 17, 18, 19 years old, and I was only working with children that were less than 17. And these girls had babies with them, and, and maybe I, one of these girls there might be a little bit younger than 17, but they had these young children with them. And I asked the pastor, I said, what do these girls do with these babies when they go into the room with the men? And they said, well, they bring the children with them. And I said, we can't have that. We can't have these children in the room with these prostitutes and these Johns. I said, maybe we should start a, a daycare center for them or a night care center. A night care center, they can go drop their children off and at, uh, in the morning, they can pick them up. At least we can have an influence on these children and maybe along the process, we can have an influence on some of these adult women that maybe this is the only chance we'll get to maybe speak some life into them. And so we started up this night care center and we called it Five Loaves. It disappeared. Five Loaves. I named it Five Loaves because I read this story about a boy that had five loaves and two fishes and his little amount that he could give, something little he could give, turned into something great and he was a blessing to 5,000 people. And that was the blessing I wanted to see in our children, that they can turn their small little lives into something great and be a blessing to many other people. And uh, most recently, I'm very proud of what we've been doing in Pakistan. In Pakistan, Pakistan is a country that is 98% Muslim. When you think of terrorists, you think of Pakistan. Pakistan is a place where we have a pastor. His name is Shamas Pervez. Shamas has a church, a thriving church of God there in that country is doing some amazing things. The church is growing like crazy in a, in a, a country that's very anti-Christian. In fact, I've seen pictures of Shema standing before a crowd. It looks to me as, as if, when I look at this picture, I look and it looks like a stadium to me. And he's standing on a stage, and, and 
I, he, he took this picture and he pans across the crowd and I'm thinking, this man is speaking in front of like 10,000 people. And I asked him, is this a Christian gathering? I said, all these people in this crowd, are these all Christians? He said, no, they're all Muslims. And I said, you're on stage speaking about Jesus to 10,000 Muslims? He said, yes. I said, how is this possible? Through all things, it is possible through Christ, he tells me. I asked him, I says, I've heard about these slaves you have in your country, these women that are, uh, that were, um, they lost their husbands, their husband took a debt, their husband had to, um, he had a, he, he was, um, he was sick, he was ill. He went into a factory owner and he took a debt. He needed some money to pay for his medical attention. It wasn't like here in America, you can't go to the doctor and get the bill later. You don't have Obamacare, you can't take care of your bill at some other period or some agency or something takes care of your bill. If you want to see the doctor, you pay in advance to go see the doctor. And so a man is sick, he has maybe a disease, maybe he has cancer. He goes to a factory owner and he says, I would like to borrow some money. He borrows some money, he goes and sees the doctor, and sometimes later he dies of his disease. The factory owner doesn't just forgive that debt. That debt transfers to his widow, wife. She now has to pay that debt. And so she goes, the factory owner comes and finds her and says, you need to come work at the factory now. And I have a factory that makes bricks. And you can work out, in the, out here at this brick oven here. And we can turn these clays into bricks. And this is your job now. You have to work this job and pay off your debt, your husband's debt. Maybe he took a debt of, say, $500. And so this woman will start making bricks. Her children come with her. And they make bricks, too. And they drop out of school if they were in school, and they start working right alongside their mother, and they start making these bricks out in the hot sun. Now, it's hot there in Pakistan, probably just as like it's hot in Phoenix, Arizona or something. But when you're next to a brick kiln and they're firing up this kiln that's maybe 20 feet in the air and it's hot and it's got a lot of heat coming off of it, it might be 130, 140 degrees working out there next to this oven, baking these bricks. And they do this day after day after day after day. And they work long hours. Sometimes they work 14, 15, even as much as 16 hours in a day trying to pay off their debt. And the factory owner takes advantage of the situation. He comes and tells these women, since you're here so much, I can provide you a bed and I can provide you some food. I can take care of your food, your clothing, your shelter. I can take care of those three things for you. And uh, you can just live here right here at the factory. I'll, you can have a little uh, space over here. Here's a little cot. You can sleep there. We'll get a place for your children to sleep. You can pro I'll provide the meals for you. I'll take care of everything. The woman has no choice. She's never home anyway. She's always at the factory. So she earns, say, 50 cents a day. And at the end of the day, the brick kiln factory owner says to her yeah you did earn 50 cents a day but your room and board is going to cost you 75 cents a day and so after months and years pass this woman that started out with a $500 debt now it's up to $1,000 and this goes on for generation after generation because the children inherit the debt when the woman dies and sometimes it even goes on for three generations. So I asked Shamas, I saw him at, a, at our conference in Wisconsin three years ago, two and a half years ago, and I said, Shamas, what can, what can we do for these women? Is it possible to just pay off their debt? And he said, yeah, that's possible. I says, well, what, what should we do? We, sh we could pay off their debt, and then what do we do? He said, we can, we can give them sewing classes We'll put them in class for six months. After six months, we'll give them a sewing machine. We'll set them up with their little, a little sewing business. They can start making clothes, and they will uh, have their own business, and they can take care of their own family. I says, it's a plan. Let's do it. And so we raised over $20,000 in the last two years, and we've paid off 23 women's debts. And some of these women now are making $120 a month and have their own clothing business, are sending their kids to a school I started called Truth Academy, where we have about 70 students 
learning Christian. Some children in this school are not the children of our widows. Some are just street children. Some are Muslim children in our Christian school that, I, that we started. And, uh, and they're learning about Jesus Christ in the school. These are the exciting stories I get to share all over, and I'm excited to have you with me here today. If you're not already sponsoring a widow or an orphan and would like to sponsor someone like Mina, if you would like to sponsor her, I'm going to have a little table out here, and you can sponsor an orphan or a widow for just $15 a month. You will not be missing any clothing, food, or shelter for 50 cents a day. Uh, but you will be completely changing somebody's life. And I believe you'll get a blessing from it. And you'll get a monthly newsletter from me, uh, like many of you already do, and you'll get to hear more stories of what our orphans and widows, about their lives and what our churches are doing around the world. Thank you for giving me this time. I'm sorry I probably went over 10 minutes. God bless you, brother.